If you're working with SQL databases, transactions should be an essential component in your software engineering toolbox. So in this video, I'm going to show you everything you need to know about working with transactions in EF Core. I'm going to use the example of the Gatherly application, which is an application used for organizing gatherings between various members. And we are specifically looking at the accept invitation command handler. Now this command handler is responsible for taking in the accept invitation command and accepting it. Now let's see what that looks like inside of the handle method. Inside of the handle method, we have a few distinct steps. First, we are fetching the gathering from the repository. Then we are taking a look to see if the invitations available on the gathering match the one that is sent in the request, matched by the request invitation ID. Then we have some validation in place for the invitation itself, if it is not null, or if the status is not pending. And if everything checks out, we accept the invitation and get back an attendee result, which contains an attendee object if the invitation was successfully accepted. And if that is so, we add the attendee to the attendee repository and we persist the changes to the database by calling unit of work save changes async. Let's first mention how transactions work with EF Core. By default, EF Core is going to create an implicit transaction for every call to save changes. If there are multiple changes that need to be applied to the database, they are all going to be applied inside of the same transaction created inside of the save changes method. This is very practical because what it means is all changes applied in the same call to save changes async are going to be applied in the database at once or none of them are going to be applied because the transaction is going to be rolled back. So this is great in the sense that you don't have to think about it. EF Core takes care of it for you. But what happens if we have multiple calls to save changes? Let's take a look at this example. We have one call to save changes right after the accept invitation method and another call here right after adding the attendee to the repository. In this situation, you're going to have two unrelated transactions applied to the database inside of the same application request. So right here, after the first call to save changes, any changes applied up to this point are going to be persisted. And then here, after adding the attendee to the repository, it's also going to be persisted to the database, but in a separate transaction. What this means in practice is that this call to save changes can succeed and the changes are going to be applied to the database, but you don't have a guarantee that the second call to save changes is also going to succeed. And this leaves the risk that the database could remain in an inconsistent state. If you ever need to have multiple calls to save changes inside of the same request, you need to wrap them inside of a transaction and I'm going to show you how to do that right away. Let's go to our definition of the iUnitOfWork interface and let's add a method for creating a new transaction. We're going to create a new method which is going to return an instance of the IDB transaction interface and we're going to call it begin transaction. If you want to, you can also add an argument here which is going to represent the isolation level of this transaction the transaction isolation level defines how much locking you want to apply for the records that are part of your transaction. If we take a look at the isolation level enum definition, you can see that there are multiple values available. The default value for the isolation level is read committed, and there are also read uncommitted, repeatable read, serializable, and snapshot. If you want to learn more about isolation levels, I suggest you take a look at the link that I'm going to leave in the description below, which is going to lead you to the documentation page on Microsoft's website. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to leave out the isolation level from our method definition, and let's just have it like this. So we're going to have one method, which is called begin transaction, and it returns an instance of the IDB transaction. Let's go to the implementation of the iUnitOfWork interface, and let's add the implementation for our new method. So inside of the begin transaction method, I want to somehow create a new transaction using EF core. And I also want to return an instance of the IDB transaction interface. It's very simple to do this with EF core. So I'm going to create a new object to hold my transaction. 
and how you create a transaction is by calling DB context and you access the database facade instance on the database property. The database facade exposes various methods for working with the database on a lower level than what TF Core offers. And the method that we are interested in is the begin transaction method. Now this method is going to return a new IDB context instance. And if I try to return it, you're going to see that the compiler is going to complain. This is because the IDB context transaction comes from the Microsoft Energy Framework Core storage namespace. And it's not something that we want to introduce inside of our application layer. So the solution here is very simple. You just call the get DB transaction method, which returns a new DB transaction, which is compatible with the IDB transaction interface. So this is how you can create a new transaction with EF core. And now if I go back to my accept invitation command handler, let's see how we can use our new method to create a transaction and wrap our multiple calls to save changes. I'm going to open the transaction right here before calling the accept invitation method. And we're going to define our transaction with an inline using statement because we want to dispose of it once the transaction is committed. So let's say using var transaction and we're going to create our transaction instance by calling unit of work begin transaction. And now we don't need to do anything with the code that we already have in place. We just need to commit the transaction after we have applied all of the changes that we want to apply. To commit the transaction, simply call transaction commit. And this is going to complete your transaction. And at this point, after transaction commit executes, is when the changes applied with the calls to save changes are going to be persisted inside of the database. You don't generally want to leave your code like this whenever you're working with a transaction. So it's common practice to take the piece of code that you want to run inside of a transaction and wrap it with a try catch block. So you're going to create a try catch block. You want to leave the part of the code that applies your changes to the database inside of the try block along with the commit. And inside of the catch block, you typically want to do some sort of error handling but it's important to also call transaction rollback. What this is going to do is it's going to roll back the entire transaction. So any changes that may have been applied successfully are rolled back and your database goes back to the state that it was in at the point the transaction was opened. So no changes after opening the transaction are persisted in the database and you can guarantee that your database remains in a consistent state. If you're enjoying this video so far, then make sure to smash that like button and also subscribe to my channel to help me out as a content creator. Let's see how our application is working right now with the changes that we put in place. I created a put endpoint for accepting the invitation and you need to specify the gathering ID in the route and also the corresponding invitation ID in the route and then you just call the accept endpoint. Now I'm going to send this request and we're going to hit a breakpoint inside of our accept invitation command handler. We hit our breakpoint and now let's carefully take a look at how our application is behaving. We're first going to fetch the gathering from the repository and this is going to hit our database and execute a query to return the gathering along with the invitations. You can see that we get back a gathering and if you take a look at the output window down here, let me just make this a little bit bigger, you can see that we have a SQL query that is sent to our database to return the gathering and the invitations. Let's carry on. If the gathering is null, which it isn't, which means we are going to continue with our method. Now we are fetching the invitation from the invitations collection on our gathering. And you can see that the invitation is not null and also the status is pending, which is what we are expecting. Now we get to the line where we create a new transaction using our unit of work. Let's step into this method to see what's going on with EF Core when we create a new transaction. I'm inside of the begin transaction method and let's first take a look at the database facade instance. If you take a look here, the current transaction property is null. 
And now when I execute the begin transaction, we get back a SQL Server transaction instance. And if I take a look at the database facade again, you can see that the current transaction property is no longer null. So EF Core is internally tracking what is the transaction that is currently live for this database context. Let's now return our transaction back to our command handler and let's see how our method is behaving. So first we're going to accept the invitation. This is going to make some changes to the invitation object and to the gathering object. And now if I run a call to unit of work save changes, you can see that EF Core has already sent a few update commands to the database. There's one update command here for updating the gathering and another command here for updating the invitation. Now this specific update to the gatherings table is going to increase the number of attendees because that is the change that was applied inside of the accept invitation method. And now let me show you something interesting. I'm going to switch over to SQL Server Management Studio and I have a query here that selects all of the gatherings that we have in the database and I only have one. Now if you take a look at the number of attendees, you can see that it is zero. Even though we just saw that EF Core sent the update statement to the database, it's not persisted. And let me run this query again, just so that you can see that I'm not making this up. The number of attendees is still zero, but EF Core has sent the update statement to the database. So why is this? Well, this is because we created a transaction and any changes applied with the call to save changes won't be visible until we call transaction commit. Let's carry on with the method and I'm going to show you how this works. So the next step is adding the attendee to the repository. This isn't going to do anything until we call save changes. And now when we call save changes, you can see that EF Core is going to send another command to the database to insert a new attendee. And again, these changes aren't going to be visible until I call transaction commit. So watch what happens now. I'm going to commit the transaction and let's go back to our SQL Server Management Studio and let's now run the query again. And you can now see that the number of attendees is properly updated to one, which is the only attendee that we currently have for our gathering. So this completes our accept invitation command handler and we can return the response from our API. I want to mention one more thing that could be interesting and let's go back to our unit of work to show you what I mean. I mentioned that EF Core internally tracks the current transaction using the database current transaction instance. And because of this, you don't actually need to return an IDB transaction instance from your unit of work. You can completely hide the transaction instance and just expose the appropriate calls on the database facade. So you have access to the commit transaction method, which is going to commit the current database transaction. And you can also expose the call to rollback transaction, which is going to roll back the current transaction. So in essence, on your unit of work, you could have the begin transaction, commit transaction and rollback transaction methods, and you won't ever need to return an IDB transaction instance but you would be making a trade-off because your transaction would be implicit inside of your unit of work or the database context in this case. If you're working with EF Core, then you need to know how to work with transactions. And I hope this video was helpful to show you how to achieve exactly that. Make sure to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss the next video I prepared. And until next time, stay awesome.